But it seems more like all these ancient mysteries and these, these breadcrumbs and these pieces around the world, these puzzle pieces, rather than thinking of them as being random, and these pyramids and temples left behind, right? No, whatever survived. It seems more like they were deliberately left behind for us to be a message. And these pieces to put back in a puzzle when we would be ready someday in our lives, when our, in, our, in our path. And that looks like it's unfolding right now with those ancient mysteries being unveiled and put together right now. And that is coming out of this figure, Zaya Sudra, who is this original first Sumerian king, which was part of the very beginning of where the story started. That was an ancient priest and sage that seemed to have this divine understanding of higher things, but had these sons. And he was basically told that the, the end of the world was coming. One of those cycles was coming to destroy everything. And that is that story has ended up encapsulating my entire life. <sighs> Matt LaCroix, welcome on the show, brother. What are you most excited about right now in your life? I am most excited to be here at a time of such exciting energy that's moving. You know, I just got back from the Conscious Life Expo in LA. We were all in these like powerful, you know, moments of connecting and talking about these ancient mysteries. And there was like a 4.5 earthquake right in the middle of it, it like right in downtown LA and everything was like shaking and everyone's like, it's time. And no, but it was like amazing to have, um, to have that. But I'm, what am I most excited about? I'm excited about being at the edge of a wave, a wave that's moving that can't be stopped. And you know, that wave is not like a gigantic, giant, gigantic wave as you would think. It's more of what like a tidal wave looks like when it's out in the ocean, not when it gets to shore. When it's out in the ocean, a tidal wave is, it's not huge, but it's consistent and moves at a speed that's incredible. It can't be stopped. It's, it, it comes across a vast plane and moves in and changes everything. And when a tsunami comes through, it washes away and it cleans everything and resets everything. And I feel like that's what's happening right now is it's that wall of water that first is creeping in and sweeping across the land because it's been held back for so long. And that energy is inevitable and it's moving through the land and people are jumping on board to go with that energy flow. And some are trying to resist it and hold back but it's inevitable. And that wave is what I'm most excited about because we're at the very edge of that. When we're bridging ancient discoveries around the world and these mysteries and these keys to unlock these things that then lead to these higher teachings that lead us back to the origins, not about simply looking forward and saying, I want to learn whatever I can from AI and computers, but then realizing that the ancients knew the actual true knowledge, the knowledge that we need, the hermetic knowledge, the higher concepts of chakras and our, our connection to as above, so below the law of correspondence. These are the aspects that truly make up knowledge, not whether or not you're proficient with an iPhone or like you can pop on and like play a video game. You know, those are skills in like the, in, in this age we're in now. But if we want to break away from that and, and not have that illusion control us, we need to realize that the true knowledge is about disconnecting from all of that noise, as I'm calling it. It's all noise, right? That's the that's kind of a phrase that I'm using for a lot of this is that we're, we're getting distracted by too much. It's taking our time and it's taking our focus. And what we need to do instead is just take all that noise and get it out of our life. Step outside. Take a walk. Who cares where you go? Just go. Let your intuition guide you. See where that journey takes you. It might take you where you never expected. We need to just get out of the logical mind and get more in here. We need to start letting this guide us. You wake up, you have a day where you don't have to do much. Let this take you some on some adventure. Maybe it takes you to go research something you never imagined, right? Like this morning, I was just looking into the, that incredible jade megalithic boulder at Hattusa, Turkey. What was that jade giant boulder? This, this big, right? It's an, like an altar. How are they using that jade boulder? What kind of energies and types of practices could they unlock with that? Our modern humans have no idea. You put, a, you put that jade boulder in a room with scientists and they're like taking measurements like me. They're like, I don't understand, right? Whereas the ancients, they go up to it and they just put their hand on it and they're like, mm, and they just activate this, like the unbelievable energy. Like we're, we're looking at this all wrong. 
And that's what is so exciting about that wave. We're bridging the old world with the new world. And we're creating that cohesive bond that has been broken thousands of years ago. Mm. Wow. Wow. Um, when you were mentioning that, that analogy of the, of the jade and how just by putting your hand on an object like that can activate a whole resonant frequency in your body and outside. I was just in, in Egypt and, and I was telling you just a little bit about that trip. Um, we were at one of the pyramids, the, uh, the one in Saqqara. Yeah. And inside there's like this huge, massive, like stone figure kind of thing. And we all went into that room and everyone just started feeling it. And as soon as we put our hands on it, people just started liberating energy, yeah. singing, speaking in a different language that no one knew what they were saying, crying, expression. Why do you think those ancient technologies could have such an effect on our energy system and on our bodies? I think they were specifically tuned for that. I think that the ancient, the ancient sites had two primary functions. One of them was creating this harmonic connection we have, an energetic connection to reach these high seas of consciousness, but almost more like an activation. So imagine it as not just raising, you know, not just raising your vibration frequency, but imagine it's more of like activating previous lifetimes even almost like unlocking something that's been blocked each lifetime karmic lifetime maybe you were an ancient priest in in in, in egypt once or somewhere in peru but like that life is long ago gone i think that places like the ancient um the great pyramids of giza have that type of effect where they're they may be like the most powerful of these temples on earth so imagine that what, what kind of capabilities would that have if you have the most powerful temple? And I think that's why people go in and have those profound experiences because it's not only unlocking these other sides of us and connecting and tuning us to a higher self, but I think it's almost merging lifetimes. I think it's almost remembering like this true essence of who we are and it activates that. And I think that's why you cry. Because it's like, it's like lifetimes of pain about not knowing who you truly were and what your purpose was. And then finally, like having all of that, you realize that it was all true, that you were part of like something greater all along. And I think that's the most profound thing you can imagine. Now, what is the other purpose? I think the other purpose was there was once an, an ancient understanding through every symbol that I study right now, especially with this work I'm doing with Turkey and others, it's this understanding that there's this concept of balance must be maintained here. This concept, this core concept of oneness and balance, but that if there isn't, um, if there are not co-creators and that type of intelligence to maintain that balance, then the earth actually becomes unbalanced. And that's actually counterintuitive to what a lot of people think is that if we just like leave the earth alone and that there's no sen uh, sentient beings here, it will be fine. But it actually, no, the earth has had a tendency throughout history to become very violent and angry. And it's discussed how some of these creator beings, the Anuna and others throughout this like more of um, angelic like nature of our of our aspects of looking at throughout ancient history and every concept of influences, they discuss this concept of like balance. They use their hands out like this. Okay. Mm. They, they had this idea of holding balance and maintaining balance here. And I would love to get into that with the show with you, but I will say though, in terms of the pyramids, not to go down that whole thing yet, but the parents pyramids, I believe were part of a giant earth grid that linked all over the world from Teotihuacan and down through Peru and Bolivia, across the world, all the way through like Southeast Asia and China and Japan and Turkey. It was a giant earth grid. It was an earth grid that was basically harmonizing the energy of the earth to balance it. And they, those ancient sages and civilizations, I believe, were in charge of maintaining that earth grid. That was what their purpose was. They were literally doing the job of the gods, which that is a road we can go down to talk about like what I really believe our purpose is and how it's been misunderstood in some ways and, and, and look, um, painted through the lens of fear where it's actually like not that way at all. Uh, and even my understanding, and I have to admit, like if you, if you look at videos that I've done from like six years ago, my understanding's changed greatly. But that's the purpose. If we're supposed to evolve over time, it doesn't mean that we totally um, pretend like everything that we had said long ago like didn't matter anymore. It's about a progressive growth of understanding. And even things that maybe you don't believe now might still help someone that you said 
long, you know, years ago, because that's part of their path. There's a path that everybody gets in this for different reasons, right? There's a whole different amount of reasons why people get into this. Being connected to nature, ancient mysteries, UFOs, or just anything that's like related to something that's un, un, unorthodox, that kind of breaks you out of that box. But I think what it all comes down to is that it tends to funnel you down this road. And I was just talking to Randall Carlson the other day, and we he had this he had this brilliant line he said about it. It's like we're all digging parallel rabbit holes. And they're all going, and the deeper we go, they all eventually just merge together. And I thought that was such a beautiful thing because it's about all of these narratives of understanding. It, and it, like someone's just like, for instance, well, I just specialize in in crystals, and I look into the energy of that. Like that's great because that's a huge part of this, right? Mm -hmm. And then another person's like, well, I'm a tarot um, reader. That's what I do. Like, well, that's another part of this too. And then someone else is like, well, I'm the biggest nerd you've ever read. I've read every ancient history, like archaeological paper. We need every piece of that. They're all facets of a greater understanding that builds into what the ancients understood. That's why if people think that they're going to get into this, this area of, well, I want to explore like the, the mysteries of the ancients and higher consciousness, just take, take it in steps. Because you, when you start to realize how big it is and how much it encompasses, you're like, wait a minute, I got to be like a semi-geologist. I got to be like a climatologist. I got to be like an energy healer. I got to be like a shaman. I got to be like an archaeologist. Wait a minute, I got to do, I got to wear all these hats. Well, you got to dabble. If you want to understand, you can't just listen to what someone's saying. You got to go see it for yourself. You have to learn about it. You got to explore it yourself. Be like, is, is that, you know, is what Emilio's, Emilio's saying right? Like, I don't, I don't want to go see if what he's saying, you know, he's talking about the Kabbalion and hermetic texts. Like, I got to go see if he's, if he's actually being true. That's good. Go do it. Go read it yourself. Go and then have that ex exploration because it's no matter how much someone tells it to you, in order for you to actually embody that in your own change, in your own growth, you have to become it. You have to go and explore it and you have to see if it resonates with you. And if it doesn't, it doesn't mean it won't later on down the line. And that's why I think the Great Pyramid of Giza unlocking that within us is about us remembering this ancient stewardship, co-creating aspect of who we were that we lost and forgot long ago. Mm. And Matt, I love that you started off this conversation with the aspect of balance, because to understand balance, we have to understand where we have gone out of balance. And that brings yeah. us to the origins of humanity. You call it the great struggle between the eagle and the serpent, between Enki and Enlil, the left brain, the right brain. Yeah. What can you tell us about that, that great division that we've seen from the very origins of humanity that Sure. Extend far out more than we than we think we uh, it does. What can you tell us about that? This is always like usually like people's favorite area to talk about because it really encompasses things they can see tangibly right on flags and crests and in ancient history. I mean, if, if same ones ever interested, like right now we're talking, just look up um, eagle. Um, eagle and, and relative eagle, like variants of the eagle throughout flags and crests throughout history, you'll see that most empires did have that symbol. And it starts to make you wonder, like, wait a minute, so what does that symbol mean? And then you look at something like, um, and not the corrupted versions later, but like the Aztec and Maya and even down in South America and others like in India, especially, and you'll see the serpent was this like very, very important aspect of their civilizations. But what do those, those two things mean? Now, I will say, when I mentioned my understanding of those slightly changing, it has slightly changed a little bit over time. I will say that the opposition that I once saw as being something that really was like working against each other is actually something that's wor more working with each other. And that was, that was something that I think for us in this path of learning all these things, we want, we want a hero. Right? We want we want someone to be the good guy. We want someone to be the protagonist. Right? We want someone to be the good guy. We want someone to be defined as the bad guy right? Mm -hmm. The villain, this antagonist. And we need that because it makes us feel like we understand things. But the more that I've had to go down this road, the more that I've realized that these two primaries, primaries, uh, primary Sumerian gods, um, Enki and Enlil, and of course, other civilizations, their names varied. Um, like for instance, in Persia, Enki was known as Ahura Mazda, and there's like other names for that as well. And then you get into um, in Enlil, for instance, up in Lake Vaughan in this Ararat civilization, he was known as Haldi. 
and then Zeus in Greece, and then Enki's like Prometheus, and then, you know, Poseidon potentially with different like aspects. And then you get into like, well, is, is Amaru um, the same being as Kukulkan and Viracocha? And then is, is or is Viracocha like Haldi? So you start seeing that these gods and the descriptions of their influences travel around the world. And it's it's steady. It's in every civilization. It's very, very uniform. And it mm -hmm. becomes something more than just like the forces of nature. Now that's there. And those forces of nature are shown embodied in a physical way, but they're also shown with more of like an actual entity. And they both usually are in unison. Some kind of an intelligent ent entity, in this case, often Enlil Enki, but sometimes like Anana Ishtar or some, some one of these other creator beings that are part of this will be shown alongside something that's like the embodiment of the forces of nature, chaos or fertility or those types of aspects. And they seem to be working hand in hand, meaning that there's a balance here that must be maintained. Okay. But there's also cosmic laws that exist. This is going deep down the rabbit hole. And now people are like, well, I don't you know. I don't understand how that, that fits in here. Imagine Enki and Enki and Enlil and there's like, like, like a council of powerful beings are not really what a lot of um, certain texts and things have shown them as. Instead of being like a group of alien-like beings or something that come here, imagine they're more like co-creators of the universe. And there are some of those powerful beings that exist and they're literally fractals of source. So not at all like this idea of some isolated group just coming and like doing whatever they want. Actually, quite the opposite. Imagine like a plan was in, was created. A plan had been a plan had been designed in the very fabric and creation of the universe, and the plan was to have an experiment. And I mean, I have I am open to the idea of multiverse and this concept that. I mean, maybe even the idea that there are universes that are even completely non-physical, like they're just energy. We don't even know. But it is interesting to think about it like that because if something, if you have a universe that's completely not like ours and, and our universe is, is energy, but it's also physical because it's manifested in the third dimension, wouldn't it be an interesting experiment to take a being that's omnipotent of every power and aspect you could ever imagine and throw it down into the lowest form of matter to have to rise back up again? It's like the ultimate story. It would be the ultimate story. And it's very interesting because in the Nag Hammadi text, you read like the, um, the ancient Gnostic text, right? The Nag Hammadi scripture is the secret book of John. And you find out that Yaldabaoth in that was this jealous, cruel God and that humanity had potentially was like threatening being greater than them or at least equal. And that idea was like, it was, he was like extremely jealous and almost angry over that concept that... Mm. I th that we could just uh, uh, achieve that. And it was more like that jealousy and that those ideas of, well, we're going to throw them down in the lowest form of, of matter, but why? Like, do we deserve that? Is that, is that a punishment? What is that? Like, why do we have to go start over again and rise back up to the top? What's the purpose of that all? Well, I realized that it's like these cosmic rules that are in place. I said like hermetic, hermetic laws are, are, actually not really hermetic laws they're caught they're cosmic laws they're cosmic constants and that's all it is they just they realize there are cosmic constants mm -hmm. and that means that duality and polarity are constants you know the yin and the yang is a constant in the entire universe that dark and light and that shift back and forth of of positive and negative that is a constant and our story weaves together those constants and morals into the development of our soul and i th think really the idea of this is Imagine there are souls that exist at a lot of um, immature levels, okay, all throughout the universe. And maybe our universe was created entirely for the purpose of, purpose of being a teaching universe. I'm not even saying Earth. Let's even go beyond that. What if this entire universe, the entire purpose of it, is souls that come from another universe that are non-physical and like incredibly powerful, but maybe some are are immature and they're and they're all in their different stages of development. And maybe it's like you know you go off to college and you're like, bye mom, and you have like a bag and you're like, I'm going off to Earth University and in um <laughs> in like the you, you, whatever universe like they call it. I don't know what, what we call it right. And they're like. 
have fun. I'll see you in like 17 karmic lifetimes. And you're like, I'll be, you know, I'll be back, right? However many it is. But maybe that's what this whole thing is because the more that I've looked at it, the more that seems to be the case is that these beings like Enki and Enlo and others are more like the teachers, okay? Mm -hmm. They're more like the teachers that came here to teach all the young souls how to eventually have that first beater car that then crash and have a big fender dender. You know, they have a fender broken and like a tire and like, pfft. we they know that. We're going through that. We're 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 learning. We're we're being distracted. We're like that. We're those kids that have to be let go to a party and get really drunk and like get sick, so we understand like what those responsibilities and those decisions are. That's us. We're those kids, and this entire thing is a teaching school. But the problem is that uh, those parents are not exactly going to be easy on us. So you can't allow a, a, a teenager that doesn't learn like the right rules to just all of a sudden have the keys to everything and then cause destruction, right? That's not, that's irresponsible. So what do you do? Well, you give them slight responsibilities. You, you help them. You start teaching them. You're like, oh, look, maybe things aren't the way you've been taught, right? Maybe look at these distractions here. Like, and think about the distractions on the real world. I love that analogy of a teenager because I think it fits every single thing you can imagine. A yeah. teenager is often distracted by a lot of things that they later like look back on or like that was silly, right? Pretty women and, you know, if you're a man or whatever, just depending on a cis attractive person or um, something that's fun, like a party or something you want to learn how to do or whatever it is, it's something temporary. It's something that you're doing to learn and understand as you go along. But that's not something you're going to do later on in life, right? And I think that's the idea now is all these things we're in, and I mean like on a high level, distractions, TV and celebrities and malls and these like material world that we get lost in with money, that's like the teenager being distracted. That's like the idea that, hey, we're going to put these distractions and you can take them if you want, but that's up to you. You have free will in this reality. You can decide to do whatever you want. We're going to offer it to you because guess what? We can, and that's part of this whole system. See, the more that I realize it's not really about the opposition of consciousness. It's about the timing of, of when things are going to emerge based on when we're ready. Mm. Because if you, if you tell someone like, hey, go walk down, go walk out in the woods in the, in the dark alone and like, I'll see you later. Like if they do that, they might get lost. But that's their choice, right? We can't expect to like have our hands held the whole time. This notion of meekness that has been introduced by later monotheistic religions of us just kind of sitting back like sheep and not and not standing up for the power we are, that needs to end. We need to stop being weak. We need to still have heart and love, but we need to be like spiritual warriors. We need to be strong again and remember our power. And that is what this old teaching game of Enki and Enlil with the eagle and the serpent really gets down to. It's these core concepts of how these different aspects of us Two primary archetypes of human nature, two, that exist. The one is this aspect of power. It's a, it's, a, it's a powerful aspect. It is like a driving aspect. It is like the left brain. It is what is really embodied into the divine masculine, but in the sense of, of a controlled energy that can be a power of creation. It can the be eagle. Force, yes, the eagle. It can be a power of a force of incredible power and strength. But imagine how fine that line has to be. Imagine how perfectly fine you have to walk that line. Where if you don't walk it just right, that ends up being the ultimate energy of destruction, like Shiva. Imagine we need to like imagine these concepts now in a different way. Okay. Now that exists. But at the same time, this other whole side exists, this right brain, this divine feminine serpent energy, this energy of unlocking the energy of chakras and kundalini, this spiraling that's inside us, this creation, right? This imagination, this imagining what a world could be, but not action. The action comes from the other side. The action of doing something comes from the other side. That's why they have to come together in this place of strength, in this place of love and creativity. And that eagle of the serpent struggle all throughout history has been very real. And you'll have a civilization that, for instance, let's take the Maya, the Aztec. Those civilizations were originally based on completely non-war. I mean, non-war at all. They didn't have any war. 
you look at the or early history of those civilizations like Ushmal and Chichen Itza, every, you know this because every structure was built for like astronomical purposes and purpose of consciousness. So that's how you know that. Whereas later, you find out that that changed. And I can tell you that I found that evidence. It was the first thing I'd ever really found in the field, mm. ever. Years and years and years ago, when I was dabbling and exploring all this, I was in Chichen Itza. And I was, you had that 8 trillion people around te the Temple of Kukulkan, all like, yay! And it's like so many people, and you're like, okay. And I'm walking around the outskirts because nobody looks at all the other stuff. <laughs> and um, there's this little, small platform called the Platform of the Eagle and Jaguars. Mm. And I was like, that's interesting. Because uh, I saw iconography around it, and, and it was amazing. And I realized, like, Knowing what I know about the eagle, knowing what, what I know about the pine cone and these symbols, it was like I, I had maybe seen something that I believe archaeologists had misinterpreted. And it was actually the first thing in the field that I had seen that I thought had been wrong. And it was so what it was, it was this platform and it showed their um, the Maya, the Maya god, Kukulkan, their great, you know, sage, this feathered serpent dragon god, which is just a, it's a symbol, but it's about like this metamorphosis of higher energy and how every, that civilization was built on those morals. Now, when I was reading though, I saw Kukulkan and I realized it was like a story. It was telling their history. So if anybody ever goes to Chichen Itza, go look at the platform of the eagle and jaguars. Where no one else looks. <laughs> exactly. And it shows, shows this, this Kukulkan with snakes coming out of his head. Okay. Serpents. And I realized that that was telling you the start. It was telling you where it began. You know, imagine Kukulkan traveling with these great sages. And Kukulkan was just like a wise sage. It's actually described by the Viracocha and Kukulkan, which is the same, are described by the indigenous people as a man that was of Caucasian origin, which I believe came from Lake Vaughan, by the way, um, and had a long beard. And we find genetic skulls that have genetic testing back to that region. So we know that's true. But we find they say he had a long beard and he was like almost like a wizard like person. It's, it's like, really, that's what they described him as, right? That's why when Cortez landed to conquer the Aztec, they confused him with being Quetzalcoatl because the, what happened is that the church, um, it was brilliant. The church ended up knowing about that prophecy of the return of Quetzalcoatl, so they timed Cortez to go land at the same time. How did they know the that timing? Because it means that they knew. It means huh. that they knew those ancient secrets, and I think they did. Mm. So what I'm getting at, though, is that when I was looking at with that whole mindset of understanding that there had been like a conquering here, I, I was reading it. And so you see, again, that traveling sage, Kuku Khan with his group. Imagine them arriving in the Yucatan, you know, tropical jungle, hot, you know, type of place. But why do they care about it? Well, the Yucatan has one of the most unusual types of geology on Earth, where it has what's called a karst landscape, where you have limestone allows these giant cenotes to be created down into the ground. In fact, the Yucatan has not one single flowing stream or river, if anybody doesn't know that. And yet it's a lot lush, tropical, beautiful place because um, trees have to go down into these cenotes and have their roots go way down in. Now, this concept kept coming up, though, about a concept of a navel. Whether it's Easter Island or Lake Vaughn with, with the deep, the depths of Lake Vaughn at 1,500 feet deep or Lake Titicaca over 1,000 feet deep. This concepts of these deep places that they seem to need energetically into the underworld for energetic reasons that we don't understand. Rejuvenation. Those seem, be, those seem to be integral to them. Now, think about a cenote. That's exactly what a cenote is. These cenotes that go deep into the earth that they would have all these rituals with, well... Imagine Kukul Khan is looking for that energetic type of energy to create a civilization, right? They need that. That's sacred. So they go there, they find that, and they find an, an indigenous group there that's living in nature. Okay, they find them, and they and he comes down, and they can't speak the same language, but he's speaking to them in their head. Perfectly, yeah. And he's, he's saying, basically, like, brothers, come around me. I want to show you something. And at first they like fight and they throw spears and ah! And then he basically, it's, it's described as having a demonstration of magic and power that is awe inspiring and having the people stand back and in awe and having him say, you know, imagine him saying, I am not here to harm you. 
I am here to guide you and show you something greater. And having them, then they basically kneel down on one knee and they, and he shows them something they could never imagined. He takes that group and he teaches them about building with giant stones. He teaches them about, about how you have to create an energetic sacred space within nature and how, how you design the structures and how you design and take care of nature creates a harmonic energetic signature that then propels into that entire earth grid. It's not just about the structures. It's about creating the space for the earth. It is that they called it in ancient Sumer, pure places of energy and that they would build temples only in those pure places. Now, I went off on a bit of tangent, but get back into that, to, um, the eagle and the jaguars, that story, right? In, in that platform, it started with Kukul Khan. Mm. Starts with him creating these civilizations of knowledge, of higher knowledge in the stars. But then something happens. Then you see an eagle. And the eagle is eating, eating the seed or the heart of like knowledge. He's eating it. And then you see this other iteration of like war on this, on this depiction. And it was, and I, I like felt sadness in my heart at the deepest level. I realized that what people had been, had missed is that that was telling us the story of the, of the creation and the reaching like their golden age and then the downfall mm. and then destruction of their entire civilization. What happened to the Maya? They went away from energy and from practicing with the stars and from being balanced. And they went through a dark period of blood sacrifice and turning into war culture and they were destroyed. Yeah. You and said Atlantis is, lost Atlantis. its heart as exactly. well. Exactly. And that is being balanced though by these Anuna gods in the realms of our reality. And they are simply the ones that are balancing those two sides. When I realized is it's not really about going out and trying to like tempt, like you don't just, you don't, it's not about corrupting them in the sense that you want to. I've had to readjust my thinking. It's more about this. I think the people corrupted themselves. I think their, I think their disconnection. And often when you look at what was going on in Mesoamerica, you find out that they were going through severe droughts and catastrophic changes with the climate. And I think that their agriculture had disappeared. And I think they had turned to dark places to try to, in hopes of bringing back uh, the rains and fertility. And one of those ways was human sacrifice. But those types of energies and those practices can unlock something. And it unlocks something that exists there as a fundamental constant. It's been everywhere. It's been all throughout history. It's anytime any dark practices are performed, which I trace back to the very origin. Started in Atlantis and, in, and then Babylon. And it was an understanding that you could also unlock the dark aspects of our reality through certain practices. And that was, is what the battle that really is like the secret battle that, that went on that people aren't, I don't think really exist even in most historical understandings. Imagine secret societies and groups where there are still, this magic is very real. They're practicing alchemy. They're practicing all of these things. And you have like a darkness that's emerging. You have a darkness that's emerging that is about a darkness of control. It's a darkness of one to control over the minds and consciousness of humanity and entrap and enslave them so that you have all the power and control. And that energy is what became embodied into the eagle. It was a symbol that never intended to mean that. And I need to make that very, very clear. The eagle in the Kef relief from Lake Vaughn that is the first eagle, I believe, in history ever. Ever. In Turkey. Maybe, maybe besides some of the cylinder seals we still have from Sumer. I'll give you guys that. But besides that, really one of the first iterations, I should say, then, is from Lake Vaughn. And what it shows is that Eagle was used as a guardian. It was a guardian for the path of protecting the higher path. Protecting it. Because imagine what would happen if you allowed someone who is dark. Imagine, and I think, I do think Lord of the Rings is a perfect example. Look at the idea of, you know, the, the dark and the light with the two wizards, right? Perfect example. What would happen if someone powerful got a, like a lot of power? 
Like how much destruction could they cause? And I think that's why this path of higher ascension and reaching these states of really becoming creators here is fiercely protected to the ultimate degree to literally be gatekeepers, to not allow anyone through who isn't of the purest of heart. And that is what was being measured by Horus in the temples where they, Osiris and Horus, where they're showing the measuring and weighing of a human soul. Mm. through a heart and they weigh it and, it's, and if it's so light as a feather it means that they're pure and that is what is being truly measured here so if you're outside and you're alone and you're like i'm gonna throw this piece of trash in the ground and nobody nobody's gonna see me because it doesn't matter right no 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 they saw you're it caught, you're, caught, <laughs> you're caught none of that gets past anyone every single thing you do is filtering through your karmic path what your decisions you're making. That doesn't mean you make a mistake you can't make up for. It. That's not how it works. Don't, don't live in an endless state of pity because you made a mistake. It's a, it doesn't matter as long as you grow past it and you find ways to make up for that mistake. There's always ways to make up for it in this life or the next. You never should feel trapped. But that's what that story, I realized going back to Chichen Itza, it was a sad story that showed how the serpent civilizations had rose up and then eventually become corrupted by that, that concept of the war eagle. And it's very apparent because in the Aztec, their warriors were called the eagle warriors. And it's like very obvious in that, like if, if people who don't know, um, in the Aztec world, the most famous of all temples at Teotihuacan they didn't build that. The Aztecs state very clearly they discovered it and found it. And so that's what we have to start getting the mindset is, but how dangerous is that is if, you, if you're an archaeologist and you think that the Aztec, a warlike group, um, built that structure, then that's why you would look at it very much in the wrong lens the entire time because you would be under that mindset. And that's, I think, what has been a challenge for a lot of ancient history and that we're trying to, um, trying to fix and correct now these great sages that you said traveled around the world starting up whole civilizations that they were in mexico they were in egypt they're all over the world on these ley lines of energy in the sacred energy structures why are we not seeing these great sages or are we walking amongst us right now why did they leave oh, yeah. or are they still are they still here i think i think we're looking at this in the wrong way we look at we look at the past and we think like we look at like Krishna, we look at Buddha, we're like, wow, those great men were individuals were there, and there's females too. Those great individuals have been there and have been like a benchmark and will never achieve that again. If anything, I think we only had a few ascended masters at that time. And now I think they're all here. I think it's like the great party of Aquarius. Imagine Imagine individuals that have lived through thousands of karmic lifetimes to build to the very moment that is at us upon us right now. Imagine every sacrifice that the ancients made was all was, was not in vain. What was simply for now, you and, and I like to think of it as like close your eyes for a minute and imagine. Imagine you're a great sage and one of these great ascended masters, and you're sitting on the edge of a ledge. And you're projecting out your energy of balance, but you know that the time you're in is over. The time you're in is ending and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And instead of being sad, instead of getting up and walking away, you know, because you open your eyes slowly and you see a wave, a tsunami that's traveling across the land to destroy everything. And that is not a symbol. It's a real physical tsunami. And it's there to destroy the entire ancient world but you stay steady. You close your eyes again and you remain calm. Your breaths remain steady and you simply sit there and allow the end of the world to sweep over because you know that everything you're doing is for another time. Cyclical. And that is exactly why the ancients knew that what they were leaving behind was like a breadcrumb trail for us to find our way back eventually. And that was, is what the ultimate sacrifice was. All the ancient temples, all the teachings, all what's left behind was for us now so that we can find our way home. Because this time of Aquarius in this great new age, this is the one that's been prophesized and sung by the ancient shamans and the ancient Maya from the very beginnings of time. They saw it long before they knew. They knew they were prophesizing long before they knew eventually there would be a time when these catastrophes would eventually end. And that this new golden age would take over and it would lead to a whole new chapter 
where there would no longer be a reset. It would no longer start over again and be complete, utter destruction, but be something that's built off of something ancient that also merges with technology to create something that's never existed before. And that is what the age of Aquarius is. It's the, it's the great enlightened time that has been prophesized for over 10,000 years. The last time that this was on earth was right before the younger Dryas destroyed everything, 11,600 years ago. And here we are on the cusp of that great era where as we come out of the Kali Yuga cycles, from being knocked down to, a, to an iron and bronze age, rising back up to a silver, embarking on the very edge of a golden age. You asked your, that question before. Every ascended master is here now, right now. And every sacrifice they made is so they can be here right now. Because this is the time when the energies of that, we help usher in into Aquarius, kind of like holding the hand of Pisces, holding the hand over there, because it's always an energetic transfer. It takes time. In fact, the time that's the most volatile is when, is when you're in that transition. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why people need to like look past what's going on in the world and think of it more like maybe those growing pains of the dark night of, the, of humanity's soul as it's rising up to, to, to take that next step. You know, that teenager that's going through those growing pains of getting in all kinds of trouble and having to be scolded and having to like learn the real lessons of what to do. We're in that right now. We're in that right now. And it, it takes time. And we have to be more patient and understanding. Be more caring about someone just because they're having trouble doesn't mean they have the same understanding and the same path you do. We have to help. We have to realize that there are souls here that are on vastly different playing fields. Vastly. You know, there are ascended masters who literally have mastered reality and have decided to come back. That's still a risky thing. You can still lose yourself here. But they choose to because it's like the ultimate. It's like the ultimate thing that this universe, I think, has been waiting for. The coolest game ever exactly. created. It's, like, it's, like, it's like the great party of Aquarius and everybody's here and they're all like, they're all ready for it. And everybody else in the street is like, hey, what's going on? Is there a party down the road? You're like, yeah. And you're like giving directions. Like, come on. That's exactly what we're in right now. The human population, to, on my understanding, has never been as great at it as it is right now. No, absolutely not. Without a doubt. Not even close. And that's why, if you imagine the earth as like a giant crystal and the earth is ready, that sacrifice was known to the earth too. The earth had an agreement as well. We need to stop thinking of the earth as like a giant terrestrial rock. It's a living entity. It's a giant crystal. In fact, it might be one of the most powerful, intelligent planets in all of the universe. And I think that's why we were chosen to be here on that, that giant crystal. Well, there was an agreement made, though. That, that Earth had to allow us to cause utter destruction on its surface, pollute it, forget our connection, stomp on it, pave over it, cause the most amount of pain and misery you can imagine. But it, she's, she remains constant and loving and she doesn't and she allows our growing pains of like a teenager to grow up because she knows too that that time is coming and like those great sages come here and they walk out they walk out of nature and they put their hand on a tree mm. don't you think that earth knows that it's it's all part of the same thing it's beautiful it's like the it's the culmination of the souls from the entire universe all coming here now and i think that's like the most beautiful thing if you want to know what the most beautiful thing of all it's that it's that right there. And that's yeah. exactly where we are right now. And if we're looking at, at Earth as, as this being, as this entity, and it goes through these cycles, and you know, you were just talking about that great deluge, the flood that, that wiped out all of the past civilization, yeah. pre-Diluvian well, times. Been least, there's been at least two of those. At least two. And yeah. for people like, that are, two, are, major ones. Yeah, two major ones are right now like asking themselves, like, oh, like we're polluting the earth, we're doing all these things, and what if earth shakes us up and goes through another? Right. Exactly. Do you think that, that could happen in our in our lifetime? I'm not saying there won't be any earth changes, but I'm, I'm saying that they won't be on the magnitude of what the ancients experienced. Mm. And what the ancients experienced was, if you've ever seen, I know this movie is silly to some people and that's okay, but I will tell you if you've ever seen the movie 2012, have you seen that yeah, movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, you know, I watched it as like a young teenager and I was scared shitless. <laughs> a couple of the silly aspects though, but in, and obviously there's some Hollywood there, but you know the scene with LA? And the yeah. volcano stuff yeah. and the tsunamis, that's what happened to them. 
that's not exaggerated. That's, I mean, maybe a little bit, like maybe a little bit exaggerated, but, and it's not like that. It wasn't like that every single part of the world, but some parts of the world were much, much more impacted than others. So where there was like the worst impact, it was like that. I'm telling you, it'd be like that scene where you'd be there and the earth is like pulling apart and everything is, is sinking and destroying. And like, that's what this Atlantis is described as. That's exactly what Atlantis is described as. Imagine, imagine a giant civilization that had dabbled in a dark energy and it unlocked something and they may even been responsible for the younger driest destructions. That's another whole like concept is if they were delving into energy and they like un unbalanced the earth. But mm. the point is it's described that 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 entire landmass of Atlantis, it was island chains and, and such, right? It was a whole civilization, but the core of the civilization is described as like subducting into the ocean and disappearing. Like the land literally going and diving under the earth, just like that movie and, and, and sinking over and then the ocean flooding over and then it's gone and then nothing's left. That's the kind of destruction that our ancients had to experience. So when I gave that, that, that view before that ancient, you know, that ancient wise, uh, ascended master sitting on a ledge, like with the end of the world that actually happened, yeah. like that really happened. And the only reason they didn't freak out is that they know cycles and they understand these cycles of energy and consciousness and they know that it's part of a greater path we're not going to be destroyed here mm -hmm. our story doesn't end with that it's it's the very story of the universe itself we are the story of this universe our our microcosm experience into the macrocosm is that entire story unfolding and i think that those teachers are here to help eventually hand over the keys to become the actual co-creators of balance here on this earth we have a long way to go before we get there. But I think that mad, that means a lot more than some people understand. Again, it's those it's it's that repairing of the earth grid and it's that repairing of having ascended masters all around the world that are literally like holding that balance. Cuz when you do that, that's when you bring the golden age. That's we bring the abundance. Imagine it's like a long winter, okay? It's deep snows everywhere. Do you know what really brings spring? Yeah, the sun, but there's a whole nother factor. Spring is described by the, by the indigenous and shamans as like singing into, into a, uh, abundance. The birds, the sounds of spring, they literally sing it into creation. That abundance is brought in. That's what we need to do. We need to sing in the age of Aquarius and the golden age. That's what it really is. It's like we almost, we raise, we, we raise the frequency and we raise the vibration of the earth and we literally sing in a new age. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what, it, what it, it really is. It's like the birds. Um, and I think that we have to understand that our purpose is mo much more significant than I think we could ever imagine. Um, it's not about us ascending to just for no reason. It's, a set, it's rising up to eventually become these powerful co-creators of the universe. That's what I think that's what this is all for. And every lifetime is about grooming that collective to grow up, to eventually become this school of not graduation, but it'll be like, eventually there will be some people graduating and it'll be more of a continuous thing that comes through in a flow, right? Where souls are going to be all of a sudden, you know, imagine a soul waking up 20 years from now. And I think this is like even, this is like absolutely not even hypothetical. I, I think it's going to be real. Yeah. Imagine a soul waking up 10, 20 years from now. Let's say 20 just to be safe. Um, their education system is like a school of like 12 kids out in a forest sitting like on a, next to a stream and they're learning about nature and they're learning about all that's what that's what those new a new souls are going to come in to experience they're going to have a completely new reality they're going to be here where they just like are put right into a mystery school right away and it's going to be completely different where the world will be people will be <clears throat> doing more of like what their skills are and their in their the things that are they're good at um, school will be more about identifying what these hidden talents we have and these, these aspects of what we bring. Because every single soul here has something truly unique they can offer. And sometimes it's many things, but we have to tap into that and identify it so we can groom every soul to be like the most amazing they could be. But in a sense where 
I think money disappears. I think what we have is a collective of people that do it because they want a better world. And we all play a part and a role in that. And we get into like a groove. And it turns, it really does turn into that. But we have growing pains long before we get there. But just imagine the potential of that, you know, that world where the collective of humanity is coming together to figure out the greatest mysteries of what we are, like what we are and what we can do. And imagine what we could do with eight and a half billion people in a, in more of like, um, more of like a grid where they're all in like a more of a harmonic connection. That I think is what truly like beams us in this like higher place. I think the earth will almost turn into like this light that's seen every single, everywhere in the universe. It'll be like almost like activating a crystal. So that's really what I've been um, looking at with our our unfolding. And I think that's really where our path is going. Yes. And you mentioned the sinking of, of Atlantis. And you know, if we're still around now, that means that some humans had the opportunity to, to get away and survive that flood. Absolutely. Let's talk about Zaya Sudra yes, and what his role is in all of this. So there are obviously survivors of these events. I've identified two primary events. I believe the first event was, let me not, let me nail that number down. I believe the first event was probably around 40,000 years ago. Mm. And I have data on what I, I, to map that, map that out. That one is still a bit in flux. Um, we're playing with pieces of data such as Zeptepi, the alignments of Leo with the great Sphinx and some other areas to figure that out. But I will tell you that there's a realm in there of, of dates in a time period that we're massaging, but it's somewhere in that frame of mind in that time period. Now, the, the one that we know, the one that's like definitive without a doubt, because we have ice cores from Greenland and we can see it very, very well in what's called the black mat around the world. It's called the younger driest layer. It's, it's a layer that represents these absolutely catastrophic times that the earth went through. And I think that the younger driest was worse than the previous event. I do want to point that out. I do think it was worse. And that's why they all disappeared. That's why those civilizations like all were wiped out. But the younger Dryas culminated and ended at 11,600 years ago, but it started it started about 13,000 years ago. But then you have to add like what's called the older Dryas and then the oldest Dryas. So it, you get a little bit in the weeds, but really what you want to think of is imagine our Earth goes through periods of ice ages and then non-ice ages. And those in-between pieces, those in-between um Times are called interglacial periods. Mm. Now, those interglacial periods are when catastrophes tend to occur on the Earth. And that is exactly what we're seeing with ice cores and looking at this, these historical records. It seems to be part of a cyclical, um, a cyclical nature that it's embedded. And let me explain that. Imagine it has to do with the sun. And it all has to do with the alignment of the planets. It has to do with outer stuff. It has to do with a lot of different things, but the sun's the primary. And it has to do with this wobble of the earth over time and all these aspects that come in. And it ties into a perfect cycle that seems to have... I've, I've been looking at Antarctic ice cores from, it, from Antarctica. You can go back 500,000 years. 500,000 years. That's as far as we can go back, but the ice cap's older than that. It shows that cycle embedded for the last half a million years. Wow. Yes. I was like, wow, wait a minute. So what is this cycle, right? Well, the cycle has to do with Milankovitch cycles. It has to do with the earth wobbling at certain times with the sun interacting. And what happens is you have these massive volumes of ice that build up along the northern, the northern and southern hemispheres and that they create massive amounts of weight and imbalance, Okay enormous amounts of weight, miles and miles of ice. The Laurentide ice sheet, which is the largest ice cap that we know of that melted off besides the, Antar the Antarctic ice sheet, was miles deep. And where I used to live in Maine, I was literally where I'd be talking. I was in a place that had like one to two miles of ice above my head at one time. Now, where I am in Colorado right now, we just had more of like montane glaciers. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, Imagine that happens on a, on a cyclical basis where all that enormous amounts of ice builds at the, at the North Poles and the earth gets really cold. And it, it's like that for 
thousands and thousands of years. Now, that doesn't mean the equator and those other areas are, but that's why places like the Sahara Desert were green. That's why those environments that those ancients were built in hadn't, didn't look at all what they look like now because the climate wasn't even close to the same. Not even, not even close. Now imagine that when those interglacial periods go from ice ages to warmer periods, it doesn't happen like in this slow, long, gradual period that like scientists have been teaching us, and that's called gradualism. Take mm -hmm. that out. Gradualism, just like chuck it out for a minute, okay? Imagine that the sun goes through things like coronal mass ejections on a, on a, on a cyclical basis. Every Are those the solar flares? Time, yes, massive solar flare. Massive. Every certain amount of time that seems to be on a cyclical basis of the earth building up enormous amounts of ice, okay? And then the sun goes through that event and it hits the earth with a massive amount of energy, okay? Melting those ice caps. The ice caps melt, okay? And then what happens well, then you have this weird effect that people don't think of. This is why the ancients disappeared. The ice, all of a sudden, trillions of gallons of, of, of water flood into the ocean. Fresh water, trillions of gallons. The oceans around the world are based on what's known as a current system. Like the Gulf Stream that comes off of the Bahamas is the only reason why people can really live in Spain and Portugal and especially like the United Kingdom. In Iceland, like you literally could not live there. It would be very cold, um, inhospitable, like areas in some places, especially the more north you go, like Finland, Sweden, it would be like arc completely Arctic. The only reason they can live there is because the Gulf, the Gulf Stream brings enormous amount of warm water and air into the entire part of Europe. And that circulation system creates an entire system on Earth where the actual the, the ocean currents are one of the main drivers of the climate of the planet. It's the oceans. It's not really what we see as like just the carbon levels. I'll get into carbon dioxide in a minute. Now, what we find though, is that when we have these massive shifts into, um, into these warmer time periods that the, the ice melts, you get two things happening. One, all that ocean water is flooding in, the fresh water is flooding in the oceans. Those currents are based on a perfect balance of fresh and salt water. That's what keeps the currents flowing. When you put all that dense fresh water in, you shut those currents off. That's why when we look at the older Dryas into the younger Dryas, we see the temperatures rapidly spiked and then rapidly dropped as those ocean currents shut off all around the world. Mm. Temperatures plummet again, but then what happens? The sun is still going through incredible activity. Okay, and what it causes is as that ice starts to melt, the poles then shift. The poles then shift because so much weight has been holding it in place that imagine something has been frozen, all of a sudden it moves because the weight uh, is now gone, and the then you get shifts. magnetic shifts, and then you get every tectonic plate and volcano on the earth going off. Then you get another double whammy. And that event then spikes CO2 levels because all the ice is melting and the permafrost, volcanoes are going off spewing meth carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Guess what happens? Every single chart I looked at in Antarctica from those ice cores going back half a million years, every single time that the ice age ended, CO2 levels spiked out ahead of it. Every single time. Proving you it had to be a mass massive volcanic set of eruptions and methane also melting off at the same time, showing you that perfect cycle, the perfect cycle. Then what happens? Well, all the volcanoes go off, all the tectonic plates go off, they melt all the ice, the earth comes back together, calms down again, you get into this nice calm um, place for thousands and thousands of years, and then of course everyone's freaking out thinking it's gonna happen again. However, I think that the cycle has been broken. Mm -hmm. I believe that the cycle is now ended. And I believe that that cycle was about simply grooming us. It was a cycle that existed here and that was very purposely doing that to destroy us and have us find our way back again. And I think that was on purpose. And I, I want to tell you that a very profound man told me this once, and I won't say who it is yet, but he said, Matthew, 
said, it seems more like all these ancient mysteries and these, these breadcrumbs and these pieces around the world, these puzzle pieces, rather than thinking of them as being random, and these pyramids and temples left behind, right? No, whatever survived. It seems more like they were deliberately left behind for us to be a message. And these pieces to put back in a puzzle when we would be ready someday in our lives, when our, in, our, in our path. And that looks like it's unfolding right now with those ancient mysteries being unveiled and put together right now. And that is coming out of this figure, Zaya Sudra, mm. who is this original first Sumerian king, which was part of the very beginning of where the story started. That was an ancient priest and sage that seemed to have this divine understanding of higher things, but had these sons. And he was basically told that the, the end of the world was coming. One of those cycles was coming to destroy everything. And that is that story has ended up in, encapsulating my entire life because of these discoveries that are being unearthed around Lake Vaughan in Eastern Turkey with direct bloodline charts back to that figure through bloodlines, definitive evidence and through genetics that are undoubtedly proving that there was a real threat and a truth there, that there was an ancient family of like the last Sumerian king and his bloodline, this seed of knowledge that had survived up near Mount Ararat. It's an absolutely the true story came from way before Christian texts though. If anyone's listened to my work, they'll understand that what I'm talking about was Zayasudra. Yes, that's the, the Noah mythos, but it came from thousands of years later in the Epic of Gilgamesh and Adrahasis in Legend of Itu, Itsubar. That's where the story really came from. It was just... It was just copied and, and brought later on into our into our society. But we have to understand that the core of that was about mankind surviving against all odds, that we barely survived. And these um, progenitors of mankind, I mean, there was indigenous groups un undoubtedly around the world, but like this seed of knowledge that came back to this divine place barely survived. And that was what the story really encompassed was reading cuneiform texts from Cavus Tepe talking about being built by Haldi and then having it come back to Enlil and then realizing the most profound thing of all, Emilio, the most difficult thing. Remember getting back into the who that like trying to have this idea in the head of who's a hero, right? Mm -hmm. Who's a villain, like, right? Who's the protagonist and the antagonist? That whole idea is like, well, wait a minute. So if those cycles are consistent and like a cosmic law, duality and polarity are cosmic laws and eagle and the serpent are just representing those different sides of those cosmic laws, then it means the hardest thing to realize was that Enki and Enlil are literally playing dualistic roles and alternating in each processional age. And we think we're in a new age. Hero, who we think of as the hero, in which Enki is the hero, he warned Zayasudra and, and had the seed of man can survive and allowed us, looks like he, at some point, had also played another role later on as being a deceiver. And then on the, on the flip side, Enlil, the very one who decided to destroy mankind in a secret pact to not tell anyone, ends up deciding to then being the greatest benefactor in lowering their golden age in humanity. It was like my, when I realized that, and then seeing and then seeing Enlil become Haldi in this Enlightener. And then Enlightener is Zeus as well, and to the Greek, the pre-Greeks, but then becoming like a jealous and evil, um, um, jealous and evil type of being, like an if, like Yaldabaoth or Yahweh, right? So then it flips back again, and then he becomes like the whole Moses story. That's that's Enlil, I believe. Okay. That Yahweh, I believe, is Enlil. So the whole thing is like mind blowing because you're like, wait a minute, I don't know how to separate good from evil. There is they're no separate. Difference. They're switching roles every but now there is and then. No difference. What we perceive as being evil is part of a greater path. It's part of a greater understanding and teaching that they're both working hand in hand. They're both created together. They're both part of the same path. So if you're being tempted, if you're if you're going along this path of consciousness and you're feeling that temptation of bad things. That's because that's there to help strengthen your resolve. Because the more you strengthen that in, say, in saying, I will ignore that voice, that voice disappears and just is, is gone and never comes back again. But the whole purpose of that voice is because your consciousness and your energy and your soul wasn't strong enough. Why would we not expect that temptation to be there? You think this is going to be a cakewalk where they're like, okay, come on, let's go. No, of course not. It's the ultimate school. Okay. Free will and destiny clash in a place that's very mysterious and we don't understand, but they're very definitive. 
and free will and destiny, I believe, have a place where I think free will tends to ride that train and destiny tends to take over depending on what you decide to do with that free will, okay? Because destiny may be one of those palpable type of timelines where there's probabilities and possibilities, but it ultimately, ultimately does come back to our own decisions. So stop pretending somebody else is going to do it for you or that maybe if an opportunity presents itself, that it'll happen again for you. Seize the moment, live in the moment. And remember that if something's being spoken to you, if you're feeling like something's strong enough, maybe it's there to help guide you in that moment. It's, it's all part of a, a web of a story. Every single person listening to this is being guided. We all have a higher self. We all have a higher self that's multidimensional, that can see a nonlinear timeline, that can help guide us. Get out of the logical mind. Stop with that. Use that to just balance your bills and stuff. Get out of that whole thing. Don't use that anymore. Use all your decision making. Use it from here. Start, start listening to this again. The more you listen to it and become more in tune, the louder it gets, like an antenna that becomes activated. You know, like that, that antenna in a jungle that's been covered in forest and forgotten, right? And you go in and you peer away and you're like, wow, look at this old technology. And you peer away the vines and you turn on, it's like, that's like us. It's like we've forgotten and it has been, it's been dormant and we're activating it within us. And that's what we truly need to do. And I wanted to say, that those teachings that come out of that last Sumerian king from those ancient sites around Lake Vaughan, first cross, the first chalice, the first ascension teachings that became the core of not only the lost civilizations, but the Knights Templar, secret societies, and all these groups comes back to this understanding of we were given the keys to everything once, only once. And the agreement was that if we lost them, they would never give them back to us again. We would have to find them again, okay? That was the agreement. It was our job to not be handed them ever again, but we would have to rediscover them. And that is what this entire mystery is, is for us to rediscover that when we're, when we're supposed to, for when we reach a certain stage of consciousness as this catalyst that then bridges the entire thing. And that is what is exactly happening right now. And that's what's so beautiful about it. Would you say that those keys are within us or is it someplace that we have to go out and find? It's both. Mm. We hold the keys to a puzzle. Okay, so we have the keys inside us, but they open doors and they connect to a puzzle that's fractured in pieces around the world. You know, people speak and echo of teachings of some spiritual leader somewhere or some ancient Buddha somewhere else. But we really have to realize that those teachings are one and the same. They all come from a core. And so what needs to truly happen is that we have to realize that that kingdom, that kingdom of unlocking that path is within us. It's nowhere else. It's not out there. It's within. All you need to find out there are those teachings to help embed, embody in you, those moral codes, those aspects of, of higher teaching. Stop pretending that they didn't have that figured out. They understood it all. Go read those teachings. Go read Hermetic text. Go read Gnostic text. Go read ancient Mesopotamian text. Go read Vedic text. They're all, they're all really the same thing. They're just giving you slightly different perspectives that are trying to bring you together to understand, look, you have that key inside you to unlock a door. That door unlocks something you can never imagine. Don't be afraid to open that door. Not opening that door is what is going to hold you back the entire time. It's up, it's up to you if you want to continue this lifetime in these karmic lives over and over again, doing that's the same thing. It, that's your decision. I'm not one to judge, okay? That person may want to do that. They, want to, they may want to come back over and over again and just kind of have a nice cat sitting on their lap and read a good book and sit by a fire and like live in a quiet life. Everyone is here for like a different path, but the thing that kind of hurts my heart the most, and the thing I think the thing I wanna say the most about this, if I could say one thing, would be the hardest thing for me to see is those with great, those with great potential that don't use it and have so much to offer, but decide to run away and hide from it. And I think that that's why we need to start not being afraid to look into the dark because it's, it's interesting because like Carl Jung said, the way to the light is actually to delve into the dark aspects of our 
dark aspects of our soul and to cleanse that before we go to the light. So it's not really the same, the path that we, we think we are. We're in that dark night of our soul right now before we can get to that higher place. Huh. The magic we seek is in the work we're avoiding. And yeah, exactly. I'm always fascinated by the synchronicities of life because once a year, um, my family and I, we go on a, a trip, a family trip, right? And we were, we've been planning it, it's about next month. And my dad just out of nowhere, he says, let's go to, let's go to Turkey. And then we're all like, no, no, let's, you know, let's go do Japan or something. And then I started getting into your work about Turkey. Yeah. So tell us why Turkey sure. is a, a fascinating hot spring of this information and what you've recently discovered. I think that above all, even though there are main, a, ancient mysteries around the world, and of course, Egypt is incredible. I think that Turkey is truly holds the great secrets of our world, because I think that's where the story goes back to. I think that's where that origin point truly goes back to. Now, some would argue Sumer, and I would agree, but there isn't much left from that. Number one, they build with bricks. And they did that sp specifically as part of an energetic thing, but bricks don't survive unless they're buried underground, which some of them are. But in general, what we can see from that that civilization is, of course, a violent place right now and not somewhere you can really go. But also, not only that, it's more difficult to see what was left over because they didn't build it with megalithic stones. Now, in Turkey, especially Lake Vaughan, but also places like Hattusa, which highly recommend other ancient places like Hattusa or San Simeon, um, you find these incredible remnants of lost civilizations. Now, just an example, before we get to Lake Vaughan, I actually want to talk about Hattusa a little bit, because mm -hmm. Hattusa is not something I talk about very often, but I'd like to talk about that again. Now, I think Hattusa was a direct offshoot of the civilization I'm about to talk about that I'm calling the Ararat civilization. But what's so amazing about Atusa is Atusa is that location that has that giant multi-ton jade block, okay, that's sitting there, and there's nowhere else in the world you can see that. This giant, perfectly carved jade block might be serpentine. They think it might be, they think it's jade though. But either way, they're related. And it's sitting there, and around it are the remnants of like primitive walls, though. Primitive walls. But below the main temple, you have the remnants of ancient um, entryways that are all that's left. It's beautiful. It's like just these little pieces of the original civilization that was there. And if, if anyone wants to look it up, go look up the Lion's Gate or Lion Gate at, at Tusa. And it's the most incredible thing. It's the same lion from Lake Vaughan, the same lion. And it's guarding the doorway, this giant arch made out of granite. This enormous arch, right? And there's all the primitive work built around it where that other Anatolian culture, probably the Hittites, came later and tried to rebuild on top of it. But imagine, like back in the day, that, that granite lion altar that was 10 feet tall, you know, wow. with people coming through, like riding on horseback, coming in to this grand temple, right? They come in and there's an incredible temple on the top with a famous jade, jade, um, relief or jade boulder that was like an maybe like an altar for them and maybe they're coming there for some to meet some some great priest right and they ride up and they get led up to this temple and they sit down and they put their hand on that jade block and they they have these profound experiences but that now imagine all of a sudden that just kind of disappears in like this fog and wind and thousands of years have gone by and tsunamis and earth catastrophes have wiped everything away and all that's left is that jade boulder and that entryway that's still partially there, just like as a remnant of what was ancient, that ancient city of what was once there. We have, we have to bring these civilizations back to life. We have to bring them back to life and embody what they really were, because they were the greatest philosophers and benefactors that mankind has ever known. They were the greatest men and women that ever existed. They were, they were not controlled by the material world like we were. They were understanding the great deepest fundamentals of who they were and the world that they were connected to. And for them, the greatest thing they could do was to reach highest states of consciousness and leave something behind that could never be forgotten. The legacy that once was, which is why these discoveries at Ionis and Lake Vaughan, I started my entire media and discovery company called Ionis Legacy. Because I believe that Ionis is the key to that entire puzzle that opens and opens a door to the very doors of our higher consciousness and divinity. That's what that door opens. And it's the first cross on earth 
the first chalice, but instead of pa passing in the sacrifice like, like way like we see in Christianity, he's passing the pine cone, the seeds of knowledge from the tree of life. And he's showing how to reach higher states of balance and ascension, literally the core of every single esoteric mystery school teaching. I believe goes back to these discoveries around Lake Vaughan and what I think was the lowering of a golden age that started right there with the last sons of, of Noah, Sayas Sudra, who his sons became Japheth, Shem, and Ham. And I believe I have mapped out there not only that they were real, but exactly the paths they took and what they created. Japheth creating all of Europe through Malta, through Menorca, and the ancient Proto-Athenians that are spoken about by Plato in the Timaeus and Critias. That's all Japheth, okay? And then you have Shem traveling down through the area we have of like Israel, down into Egypt. And that entire story coming from the Shem line, which is fascinating because the first cross we see in, a, in, a, in, in a, um, the Assyrian civilization, if you go look it up, his name was Shem C. Shem C. That's the name of the Assyrian king that had the first cross later on as that group passed south and then created again the Assyrian civilization out of the ashes of the Sumerians. Shem C. Shem. There you have the exact connection back to Shem. Now, the other one, Sham, I believe, went off through Iran, down through India. And that's where we have that whole connection around the world. But I think those three sons went off and created the golden age as we think of it. And even Atlantis and the Proto-Athenians were the, the pinnacle of those civilizations eventually. Hmm. And going back to what we mentioned a bit earlier about Atlantis, that it lost its heart essentially yeah. and they were in a golden age what what do you what do you think happened uh to those great civilizations of lemuria atlantis and why did they get the so far off track the, yeah well atlantis specifically is the best example because it's very well documented if people don't know the story i highly recommend you you read the timaeus and critias and also diodorus um uh, solon diodorus plato that group had all the atlantean knowledge it seems like um, because it came from Egypt. It came from a place called the Temple of Sais. Um, and there was a lost amount of knowledge that was passed from there before the destruction of Egypt, which was later, it was later lost. But there was an ancient priest known as Sanchez, okay? And Sanchez was one of the last legacies of these ancient priest historians that knew and was guarding the story of the past. And he was all that's left. And when Solon visited Egypt to the temple of Sais and met with him, with his other priests, that's where they learned the entire story. And it was embedded into the temple walls there, the whole story, our story. In fact, the temple of Sais, its only purpose was to be a, a catalog and a record, not just of the records of mankind, but a, specifically of a record of its history. Like a time capsule. It was a time capsule. And... <laughs> If Solon had never visited Egypt, we would never know the story of Atlantis and never know it existed. And, or at least not have definitive knowledge of it. We would have it through other means potentially, but not like that. And that's why the reason I'm trying to say that is if you read that, read what Plato says in there, you find out that first he says that this is a real story. So we have to get past the whole idea that that's an, an, an allegory or something, right? It is, but it's also not. It, it's, it's a real example, but it's also the perfect allegory for what can happen to a civilization. It's both. That's the ultimate example. You'd want to use a real live example because in this case, what he's writing about is that there's two dominant civilizations that existed. Now, I have evidence to explain why not three. Because in the ancient Tibetan library of the Temple of a Thousand Buddhas that was found in 1901 by um, that, that whole like group that was exploring Asia for the first time coming out of anthropology out of the University of uh, England. When they explored and met those monks, those Taos monks, and they found that ancient Tibetan library, there was a map that showed um, Mu Lemuria as being a civilization that was destroyed before Atlantis. It actually succumbed way before that, and that's why you didn't hear about it in the Timaeus and Critias, because it was already gone. But I think that if you want to see evidence of Lemuria, Mu, um, I think that Tonga, uh, the whole Maui, Tonga, that Pacific area with those giant um, uh, Guam, that area has these huge um, T blocks, T shapes. Um, it's actually funny because in that, I know the Disney, the Disney Pixar movie with Moana, mm -hmm. um, that god Maui is actually really the god they say built those. 
It's like wow. mind blowing that they always like, spark Tonga. sprinkle in a little bit of truth in uh, into these movies. Marvel, exactly. Go look up Tonga and Guam and these. Um, there's a number of other Mauritania islands, and I think there's another one where these these same giant. Um, they're limestone, but they're still enormous because I mean they don't have any other type of stone there. These huge pillars that are just like the tea pit pillars we see elsewhere, multi ton, and the the groups there, the indigenous groups that have been there for for a long time. I mean, those groups have been there for many many generations. Um, they're like, no, we didn't build them. That was Maui, which is just amazing because it gets back into this idea of well, are all these just these shared? Um, powerful either sages or types of beings that travel around and create civilizations. Now, I say that because what does what does the Timaeus and Critias actually say? Well, it doesn't mention Mur Lemuria um, that was already gone according to this ancient map that I had seen. Hmm. And, but it states that there was two civilizations that were the primary civilizations, the only two on the earth. It says that Atlantis had grown to the a massive power, an empire. And it was threatening, actually, a lot of the world. And I don't know, a lot of people don't know this, but it was discussing how it was actually taking, um, it was actually using slavery from Africa, which is where that actually started, is way before people think, is that Atlantis was actually using slavery from Northern Africa. Um, yes, and the whole thing is sad because Atlantis used to be based on this pureness, kind of like uh, Chichen Itza and the Maya. Same thing. And they just eventually went down a dark road of practicing black magic and corrupting themselves and going down this dark path of becoming a war empire. And that's exactly how it describes it, that they became a maritime, maritime still, war empire. And that they were conquering and like taking over the world. And it's described how there was only one nation that could stand up to them. Only one. The, of all the powers of the world, the only one that could stand up to them was the Proto-Athenians. Uh -huh. Called the greatest, it was called the greatest democracy and greatest civilization ever created. Um, which is interesting because it was made by Zeus, though. Because I very much think um, Poseidon was Enki. So it's we got to start looking at this in a little bit of a different lens because in the story, the Proto-Athenians ride out against the Great Atlanteans in the greatest maritime battle the world has ever known. I, I want to point that out, is that the greatest maritime battle the world has ever known was against the Atlanteans and the Proto-Athenians, which is what I think the entire war of the Titans and the Olympians was. Wow. So that was what I think it was based on. Because think about the Olympians. Mount Olympus was in Greece with Zeus, known as like the younger gods. And then the Atlanteans was the older gods. That was the Titans. That's what I think that ancient war really was really talking about. And what happened out of that? Who won the Titans versus the Olympians? Do you remember? The Olympians. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it's just what Plato says in the Timaeus and Critias is that in the middle of this battle, in the middle of this battle, like imagine this, it's like something out of a movie, right in the middle of the battle, Atlantis is fighting. Atlantis is fighting the Proto-Athenians exactly eleven thousand six hundred years ago, right before the flood. Right when these earth changes are undergoing, and it's described that in the middle of this, the Atlanteans, their entire nation, sunk in the sea, and that's why they lost. Is that the Earth destroyed the Atlanteans, and that the the Greeks won that battle. But after that, they were also destroyed by the earth changes. Mm. And um, it was a sad, it was like a very um, somber moment to think about for a moment. Because here you have the greatest de democracy and civilization that ever existed taking on this corrupted empire and winning and being like this beacon of light. understanding and like perfection because that's where they came out of and who did they get all that from japheth the very same mm. one who was the builder of the lake vaughn civilizations who has the direct name of hikeberg you'll see coming from a lineage who hike king hike who is a direct descendant of japheth who is the founder of the armenian nation 
which is basically that area of Cavus Tepe and around Lake Vaughan, used to be ancient Armenia. So the whole thing is unraveling to the story that goes back to the very origins of everything. But and that's a bloodline. That, you said King right. Hike. Sorry to interrupt you. It's a bloodline yeah. of, of demigods. Exactly. Shed light on and that, that is exactly why the Greeks considered that the same thing, and so did the Atlanteans. Imagine Shem's, Shem travels south through ancient Iraq, through Israel area, that whole region, goes down into Egypt, and then goes and creates Atlantis out through Mar Maritania. That's true. Out off of off of Africa in the Azores and that whole area out there. That's that's absolutely true. Whereas Japheth goes west and then creates the Proto Greek civilization. So they're both. They're both these civilizations are being created that one time, but then there's other civilizations traveling around the world creating all this. So it's like, it's truly like a lost history that we don't remember that was lost to us. And then we're trying to put those pieces and those, those fractals back together to understand who we really are, because it really is like humanity. Our story is truly the greatest story that's ever been told. Yeah. And diving really deep into the bloodlines, um, because you've talked about the secret societies, all that, how they worship like these ancient bloodlines. We see it in, you know, in, in even in, in England, the, you know, the, the with the queen yeah, and all of that royal, stuff. Yeah, the royal family. So, what is the what is the importance of bloodlines in, in all of this in the ancient history of humanity? Well, first of all, um, that's a tricky area because you have to be very careful not to feel like there's a superiority there. Exactly. And I want to start by saying like every every group of every racial group, every group of whatever person you are, like you're beautiful and every group <laughs> is beautiful and, and absolutely around the world. The ancients believed there simply were certain gifts that had been imparted like demigod like gifts that are now infused all over the world, of course. But there was like a bit more of an origin they could track, they could trace with them. OK, so they would like trace them back to certain places. And that's they felt. And I am not saying I support this at all, but they felt that some of those gifts made them feel like a superior bloodline. And so it would be like a bloodline that somehow connected back to this. And that was actually the basis for the royals and a lot of these secret societies that ended up becoming very powerful was based on that idea that their lineage went back to somewhere that they thought was very important. Now, I think that that has caused nothing but misery on the earth yeah. and destruction. And I think that needs to end. All people are beautiful and the gifts are infused everywhere in, a, in, in, in humanity right now. And I think it's more about exploring those mysteries and when they came from. And rather, let's, let's move past and worrying about where the genetics went because they're everywhere. Everybody has it infused in them. And let's let that silly old hierarchy of um, some feeling like they're better over others, let's let that silliness go because that's controlled us for a long time. Mm, thank you for for honing that in and you know a lot of people watching this right now including myself are fascinated with learning and you know we go to bookstores and we get all these books but i wanted to shed light on a very special library found in 1849 asher banapal library you said it's the most precious source of historic material in the H. world hd wells hd wells hd wells right one of the greatest writers we know imagine a quote that nobody knows about, who from one of the most famous writers who literally said that. If whoever, anyone doesn't know, thank you for saying that. H.G. Wells said, after studying that library called the Asher Bonapal Library, found in 1849 in Iraq in a place called Nineveh, which today is called Mosul, the greatest library ever known. He, that, that doesn't come from my words. H.G. Wells said, is the greatest collection of historical material in the world. From the Ashurbanipal Library. Now, think about Atlantis, the knowledge of Atlantis coming from the Temple of Sais, but the Temple of Sais is destroyed and lost, so we don't have that anymore. The Library of Alexandria was burned down multiple times. It's actually burned down twice, so people don't know. Twice. The first time it was burned down was partially burned down, and supposedly it was an accident. Um, I know people are going to call me out. They'll be like, well, if you look at it, they say that 
Caesar was fighting a, a war against the Egyptians and like some of the fire from that fight from arrows and stuff accidentally landed on the on the archives and on the on the library and parts of it was accidentally burned. I'm so sorry that happened. And then of course and the mysterious it was all burned and that burned Oops. down the ground after that. And that wasn't that was another accident or that was accidental. I don't know. But it's because no one wants to take credit in history for burning one of the most important libraries to the ground, right? Uh, but seriously though. As important as the Library of Alexandria was, the Library of Ale uh, Ashurbanipal, I think, was more important because it contained more ancient records. It had to. If you have paper, which the Library of Alexandria was like all paper, basically, paper lasts 500 to 1,000 years in the best conditions possible. That means you'd have to keep rewriting it over and over again, and that gets challenging. If anyone's ever played the phone, phone game when you're a kid, you can imagine how that works out. Um, but... That means that you have to have another way to, to leave a message, right? Well, how would you do that? Well, you would have to use cuneiform to etch in a way to preserve a message that could not last 500 to 1,000, but how about 5,000 years or 10,000 years, depending on how it was uh, taken care of. So there you all automatically have a whole different kind of um, record keeping, something that can uh, that can last a lot longer than the others. And that is exactly what the Ashurbanipal Library was. It was more than 40,000 cuneiform tablets that basically gave us the greatest, um, the greatest historical look at our past that we'd ever had. And when the Sumerian um, language was cracked with the first with the Epic of Gilgamesh, now remember, there's there's other there's other versions of that. There's an Akkadian and Babylonian version of that too. Not the same language. Just because something is written in cuneiform, that's not a language, it's a writing style. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's different languages that use that. It's it's a writing style because it's the most, it's the only writing style. I want to point that out. How else would you, unless you're using like crystalline technology to somehow embed into like a megalith that has a lot of silica. Um, the only other way you're going to be able to leave a message is going to be etching into cuneiform or etching into stone like the Code of Hammurabi. Because if you have a, if you have something etched in, then it can survive the test of time. Like if you paint on a wall, mm. right? We think painting on cave walls is so sophisticated. It, that doesn't last that long. Water drips down. It like gets rid of it in some cases and you just have pieces of it. Plus that's all. Cave drawing is usually always from like a very primitive group anyway. So it doesn't even correlate. But what I'm trying to say is that the Ashurbanipal Library gave us a glimpse into a history that we didn't understand. We didn't know. It gave us a glimpse into these tablets that then led to these discoveries that I'm working with right now. That's the only reason that exists, because of this ancient understanding of Sharupak and these first cities, which is why I'm headed to Penn Museum to that first excavation that found Sharupak as part of all this, to like go through the archive, like something out of like National Treasure, which is in Philadelphia, by the way, Penn Museum. It's going to be very cool. Like, wait till you see where this is going to go. But we started there. That's where the mystery begins is like in the archive of an ancient library, peering through and looking through the records to be like, oh, this mystery then takes us to a, a museum in Turkey and then to Lake Vaughan with these ancient temples that are mysteriously left on tops of mountains that nobody even cares about and that have been like left to the, to the world. We're going to rebuild that ancient understanding and help rebuild that earth grid in the future. That is what our, our entire organization is trying to do is in a, in a greater way, we're trying to be a movement of ancient history, archaeology, spiritual ascension, and lost teachings to bring together mystery schools and rebuild what was lost long ago. So not really like anything easy, but we're, we're going to do the best mm -hmm. we can. You mentioned the drawing on the walls, and I just wanted to briefly mention um, the King's Chamber and some new discoveries sure. that are coming up around that. I was just in Egypt uh, with Robert Edward Grant, and before entering the King's Chamber, he says... Love Robert. Brilliant, brilliant polymath mind. Brilliant mind. And he says, he's been talking about this recently, um, of what's coming up in, around the King's Chamber. And basically, what he told us before we entered was... Don't try to see the walls with your human eyes, but with yeah. your third eyes. And you'll start yeah, to exactly. see you'll start to see certain figures. You might see a phoenix, you might see a bull, you might see, you know, different different things. Yeah. And yeah. and I started seeing uh some figures around the wall. And what he told me afterwards was those are the the 32 decons of the zodiac embedded uh, in the walls of this of the king's yes. chamber. That makes and total sense. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I, I was really interested well, to hear. It, 
so we know that the we know the purpose of the great sphinx right it wasn't a pharaoh it was recarved they screwed up all head it's silly now the way it looks right it's just a little head on a big body um if anybody doesn't i'm the lion right now like that was a lion uh, we know that because it was facing leo and it was a guardian we know the lion was the most important guardian symbol bar none in the material physical world now the the eagle and the griffin was usually is more associated with like a guardian of the higher realms okay so that's not the same thing that's why it's not a giant eagle as a sphinx on the ground it's a lion because the lion was the embodiment of not just a lion as power as we see it here but leo okay leo leo is the lion now if you align that kind of a guardian type of aspect that energy and you align it to leo you're creating a synergy there then the great pyramid of giza the queen the feminine energy is pointed to sirius right and then you have the masculine energy is pointed to orion you're creating like a giant synergy there a giant synergy that is very specific that they understood that whole harmonic aspect of the size of the earth, the moon, the sun, the ratio is embodied into the embodied into the great pyramid. The great pyramid is there's a reason there's three, there's three pyramids. There's three, only three for a very reason. All the other pyramids have other purposes. They have higher consciousness, other energetic purposes, but there's no there are no structures just like that in that same way. Teotihuacan Khan kind of maps it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But imagine the Great Pyramids of Giza are like the very heart of the Earth grid. They're the very heart of the Earth grid. And they're where, they're where the Earth grid is the strongest and then it spreads around the world with all these other nodes. Okay? And if you look at Lake Fawn with the teachings from Kef Temple, you'll see this triptych doorway teaching in there, this, these three doors, three step pyramids, and the center door unlocks this, this like flowering of consciousness. And they recognize that there was these three aspects of us, these three, the mind, body, and the soul, these three components that make up of us. Also, our solar system is an exact replication of that. Exactly, the earth, the moon, and the sun, exactly the same thing. So they build three pyramids, with one being the largest, to create that perfect synergy of heaven on earth and create that grid. So when you experience that zodiac experience in there, that's because the entire purpose of that is to be a balancer for the ages of procession ages of the earth, the processions of the zodiac, which every single one lasts 2,100 years. They're part of what's called the great year, which is a 26,000 year period that the earth goes through its full procession over all the different energies. It's a cycle. It starts and it ends every 26,000 years. That's exactly how it goes. And that's why we have to look at where we are in that. Where are we? Well, we're going out of the age of Pisces. Now, isn't it interesting that the, the Holy Roman Empire and all those events, and we won't mention what those are, but those were exactly 2,100 years ago when we entered in the age of Pisces. Okay? Try to think of it like that. How about Is, we were entering the age of Pisces and that's what that was. Now, because they knew the Roman and Holy Roman Empire, now we're exactly 2,100 years later, right about, and we're entering the age of Aquarius now. And now you're going to see a completely different kind of symbol emerge not a sacrifice, not a sacrifice symbol and um, more of a darker energy, but you're going to see something completely different. Um, and that is going to become very apparent. And it seems like these discoveries at Lake Fawn with these ascension teachings and this triptych doorway that um, literally was known by the ancients all around the world. It's no coincidence that that, that doorway is, is also shown by Da Vinci in The Last Supper, okay? Yep. Three doors. Go look behind them. And all the triptych doors around the world, The back to the origin of Lake Vaughn with the three doorways, and then just so happens that our solar system has three, the sun, the sun, the moon, the earth, and then there so happens to be three pyramids there. It all is exactly mapping this giant grid and harmonic law of correspondent as above, so below, as within, so without. 
It's the whole constant concept of you create that in the physical world, and then within us, we also create the very same thing. And when we do that, we will eventually merge with that understanding and that knowledge to activate something that has not activated in us, again, since 11,600 years ago. Yeah. Just while you're explaining that, this thought come, came to mind of, you know, my knowledge of, of the Zodiac and astrology is that you start with Aries and you end with Pisces. But if we're in Pisces going into Aquarius, would that mean that time is sort of shifting backwards? If, if the Pisces is the last sign that the Zodiac goes through and Aquarius being the one before that, are we reaching the end of one cycle and then moving yes. backwards in time? We're reaching the end of a cycle and beginning something new. That's exactly what this is, is that it's the end of that old energy. That old paradigm of energy is dying with Pisces. And we are embodying an entire new entry. The earth is entering in our consciousness and our vibration, our energy is entering a new energy. It, it has to. It's defined by that. It's amazing. It's almost like this is the way you think of it. Imagine there's two highways, okay? And everybody's driving on one highway and there's guardrails. You can't go anywhere. You're driving on that highway and all of us, and that highway is Pisces. We're all like in traffic and we're all like yelling at each other, yeah, you know, like angry. And, and then all of a sudden, it's, you know, like, you know how a train is driving and they divert the track and all of a sudden, whoop, you're on a whole nother track. That's exactly what happened. All of a sudden, everyone's driving and that train like diverging where the highway just shifts over into another road and everyone's on that other road. They're like, they're driving on it. It's like, whoa, this is like, this is beautiful, right? It's peaceful, it's calm. It's not the same road. It's not the same road. It's a different road. And so the energy has to go with it. That doesn't mean there's not going to be some fighting against it at first, kind of pushing back against the old way. Any energy that's dying is always going to try to hold on to itself and not relinquish it to the next. That's how energy works. When it's, it, Energy cannot die. It can only change state, right? Mm -hmm. So it can't be created or destroyed. It can only change state. So all you're seeing is the energy changing state, an alchemical process of higher consciousness and cell mutation into the age of Aquarius when it's going to be a new paradigm. And the old model that once existed, like the Maya say, through the fifth prophecy, the Maya, all fear-based systems, all empires will fail, will collapse, and they will have to be transformed into the new age. And that's exactly what you're seeing right now. Hmm. I have about like 10 rabbit holes we can continue to go yeah, down. I, I, gotta, and I, have to, I have to go in a second, okay? <laughs> I wanted to begin wrapping this up and we have sure. to continue this conversation, brother. I love I love your beautiful mind. And, <laughs> Thanks. Um, I want you to first, uh, we have a, a segment called the Final Trio, which are rapid fire questions at the end of every show. But I wanted to send people where they can connect with you. And especially I want you to mention the Lost Era at Civilization film sure. so people can support that. Yeah, uh, we're embarking on something that has maybe never been done. We're going to be capturing an entire expedition of discovery from Turkey. Uh, we'll start at five countries. So starting in the United States here in Philadelphia and then going to Turkey, um, Peru, Bolivia, and then Egypt in a giant story that unlocks this mystery and these teachings around the world with the, some of the best experts and scientists we have. Paradigm shifting archaeologists for the first time in history coming together and other scientists coming together to change this entire paradigm and explore a mystery the way it's supposed to be. You know, we're going there with this notion that we know there's a mystery and there's profound connections and it's undeniable. So now we're going to explore that mystery and everyone listening to this can be a part of that. You can go to the stageoftime.com and go to the documentary film page and you can actually contribute and be a part of that amazing adventure where we go there capture it all, be part of those mysteries. And that's already happening right now. And it's coming. And I, I can't announce when yet, but it's coming quick. And we're going to be taking that all on with your help and everyone else that's helping to do this because this is, this is coming from everyone else. It's like a move. It's a movement. It's a movement. And what's going to come out of this is exploration in a way that's maybe never been done to provide these teachings and provide this lost knowledge in a, in a place that comes together that can truly move people in a powerful way. So if you want to be part of that, please check out the stageyourtime.com. 
Yes, and we have everything linked in the bottom in the show Thank notes. You, and that. please go support Matt on this mission to raise <laughs> consciousness, brother. Um, for the final trio, we have two questions personalized to you. And then the sure. last one we ask at the end of every show. The first one is, what is one understanding of history that will completely shift the trajectory of mankind's future? I would, I would say undeniably the one that comes to mind. There's so many I could pick for that. That's, that's a hard one. But <laughs> it's also not at the same time. I would say Ionis is going to change everything. That one place. Everywhere else, I mean, Kef's important because that's, that's a periphery and connected to it. But Ionis with the first cross and, and those, that temple, um, that'll change everything. And that temple will become, I think, the most holy and sacred place on earth in the future. Um, and so that you want to answer the question is when people learn about Ionis and learn about these discoveries, hence my company, Ionis Legacy, they're going to see that this first cross takes us back into the very heart and origin of what everyone has been trying to figure out all along. It didn't mean sacrifice. It meant oneness and connection to all. It was an ultimate balance back to the higher creator. Um, the, if the three represents the, the way for us to have the path to reach higher states of consciousness, the four was the balance and totality of all. Four cardinal points, four elements, um, as above, so below, left, right. It's everything. It's like it's like the oneness and understanding of everything. And so mm. it really is the totality of the most important symbol that ever existed. And so to have that origin point, I think, will actually change all of humanity in the future. Mm. Beautiful, brother. The second question, we met um, in a very interesting moment, leaving a hotel uh, in Miami, yeah. Uh, going to Billy Carson's uh, conscious award ceremony. And it was right at the time where you shockingly met uh, Robert Schock for the first time. <laughs> right. And I wanted to ask you, out of all, you know, you've had so many mentors in this field. I see Gra Graham Hancock's book behind you. Um, what is one piece of wisdom that these um, OGs, let's call them, in, <laughs> in the ancient civilization space have imparted onto you? Man, that's a hard question. I have to think about that for a second. Um, <laughs> I think, I think the one thing I would say that is echoed by every single one of these great minds is never to never stop seeking the truth, no matter how, where it goes or how deep it goes. Never stop seeking these greater questions to the greatest mysteries we could ever ask. Yes, sir. Never stop seeking. I love it. Last question, brother, is called time capsule question, and it requires us to travel. Actually, you mentioned it in the episode 20 years down the line into the future. Sure. And you were given the opportunity to have a time capsule. And this time capsule was going to be meant for the next generation of leaders. So my generation now in 20 years, stepping more into leadership positions to really yep. spearhead into the new consciousness you could include anything you wanted in this time capsule for them to open and have the the guided wisdom um, from you uh, to carry out the new earth. And what would you include in there? It could be anything from books, something non-physical as well, a frequency, a transmission. Um, really, you can just include anything you wanted inside of this time capsule. What would it be? We would have to include every aspect of the greatest cultural aspects of our society to start. The Da Vinci's, all those things. We have to include all that. We have to create. We have to include the greatest poetry that's ever been written. We'd have to include the greatest books, but we'd also have to include like the greatest educational books, things like ancient, ancient history, mysteries, hermetic teachings. You know, the Kabbalah, and there we'd have to every hermetic text, the the Bhagavad Gita. We'd have to include um, every Mayan, every Mesopotamian cuneiform story from like the myth of Adapa to the Eridu Genesis. It would have to be a collection of the greatest minds and the greatest things that were left behind from humanity in a way that could help guide us to show us what we what we left behind. And I would not be anything simple or materialistic. Um, I think it would have to be as much wisdom as we can impart um, and not just leaving a bunch of iPhones and stuff. Mm -hmm. And on top of the time capsule, there's a gold plate with your name on it and you can etch in a question for these leaders uh, to get them to contemplate as they're going to lead the new earth. I guess they would say, who are we? Hmm. Who are we? Really? Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Man, Matthew, I really appreciate all the work that you put in, man. I can't even begin to describe 
how much you are making waves in the world and <laughs> it's just an honor uh to be able to witness you and your genius and i'd love to continue our conversations i i feel like we'll be running more into each other down the line and um yeah beautiful opportunity man thank you so thank much you, Emilio. For all the work i you love do. um love your positive messages and everything you're doing so i mean thank you for this amazing conversation until next time my friend okay until next time brother <laughs> <laughs>